Johnny Dollar. Dollar, this is Ted Orloff. Orloff? Yeah, you remember. Western Indemnity Company out here in Los Angeles? Oh, of course, Ted. How are you? Fine, just fine. Gee, it's been a long time. I know, I know. Uh, now, uh, tell me, are you free to come out here? Come out here right away? I don't know why not. What seems to be the trouble? One of our clients owns a small bottling plant. Yeah? His name is Garrison. Barney Garrison? Go ahead. Called me and told me that somebody's pulled an embezzlement on him, taken nearly $170,000 from his till. Uh-oh. Under the seventy grand, yeah. Well, can you make it? Can you come out here? I'll pick up a plane schedule and call you back, okay? Fine. Okay. <laughs> Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Western Indemnity Company, Home Office, Los Angeles, California. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the shadow of a doubt matter. <laughs> Expense account item one. Three fifty for the call back to Ted Orlov to tell him the best deal I could make was a flight out of Hartford at 7.20 the following morning. Item two... One eighty-five seventy for the plane ticket. When I got to L.A. a few minutes after noon Pacific time, Ted was waiting for me. I piled my luggage into the back of his car and we took off. Now, now, Mr. Bernard Livermore Garrison, Barney Garrison. Own some kind of a bottling plant. That's right, soft drinks. You know, root beer, sarsaparilla, lime, orange, the works. And just now, today, as a matter of Watch fact... Watch it! Okay, it's okay. Why well, didn't she signal that turn? Crazy Southern California drive. Uh, we, uh, we were going pretty fast, Ted. Been out here seven years now. Seven years, Johnny, but I still, well, I can't get used to it. These natives all drive around like an accident, just going somewhere to happen. Yes, they do. But like I started to say... Yeah, Ted. Somehow, somewhere, Barney Garrison raised himself a lot of money. And he... Really set up this plan. Uh, who is Ralph Betterly? He's vice president, and yikes. Crazy, Kelly. What's the matter with that guy? Hey, Ted, uh, seriously, hadn't you better slow down a little? Now, stop worrying, Johnny. We're just... About Ralph Betterly. Vice president and business manager, I guess you'd call him, handles the bookkeeping department, that kind of stuff. It's almost a sort of partnership, Johnny. Kind of a partnership. So why those two would ever get together, I'll never know. Why do you say that? Well, about as opposite as any two people could ever be. Ralph is a quiet, little, ingrown old man. He isn't really old, probably not more than two or three years older than Barney. But he looks and acts it, quiet, meek, responsible citizen. Mm -hmm. He and his wife have a nice little home on Pandora Avenue in Westwood. And Barney Garrison? Big, well-fed, back-slapping, hail fellow, well-met sort of a guy, talks to anybody and everybody, a real salesman. He's a bachelor, has a big eye for the gals, and really lives it up. Gets along with anybody, drives an expensive car, has a showy home in Bel Air, has just bought one in Palm Springs, entertains like mad, and... Well, you know the type. I think I do. Just the opposite of Ralph Bradley. Just the opposite. Well, opposites always attract, they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess they... Hey! What's the matter with you? You crazy or something? Didn't you see that stop sign? Jerk. You'd think he was the only one on the road. That was, uh... It was a little close, Ted. Oh, some of the cooks behind the wheel have absolutely no consideration for anyone else. As I was saying... Yes, uh, let's get back to the embezzlement. Well, Barney called me yesterday, just before I called you. They'd have been going through the books of the uh, cash on hand. Uh, for some reason, they keep a lot of cash on hand. Mm -hmm. And as near as he can figure it, there's about 170000 gone. That's yes, yes. But what does this Ralph Betterly think about it? I don't know. I told him we'd call on him after we've seen Barney. So after you've talked to Barney, we'll come back here. Come back from where? Palm Springs. That's where Barney called me from, uh, where he's waiting for. Oh, I see. Hey, watch the stoplight ahead, with him. Huh? Oh. No, instead of uh, driving on down there, we'll cut over to Lockheed Airport in Burbank and take a plane. Take his plane. His plane? That's right. His own personal private plane. Well, isn't it just about as fast to drive down there? Yeah, sure it is, but uh, this is the way he wants it. 
Okay. We'll do it the way Barney wants it. Once at the airport, we hopped aboard Garrison's Twin Engine Beach. The pilot took off, and in almost less time than it takes to tell about it, we sat down at the Palm Springs Airport. Oh, I promised to meet us here, but I don't see any sign of him, not a sign. What time is it, John? Uh, I have exactly 20 minutes past two. After five? Sure. <laughs> That's Eastern time. You forgot to reset your watch. Oh, of course. Well, that makes it 20 after two. Pilot called him, though, so he shouldn't... Huh? What's the matter? Nothing. I, uh... I was surprised to see those long, thin clouds up there in this desert sky. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I... Oh, wait a minute. Those are just, uh... Kind of... Tail end of a sky riding job. Look there behind you. The sky rider's still at it. Hmm? Oh, yeah. P O P P O Papo? <laughs> when he's finished, that'll spell Papola. What? Well, that's a fine way to decorate an otherwise clean, clear blue sky. Don't knock it. Why not? That's Garrison's brand new product. Oh. And like I say, today's the first announcement of it. But now, where in the Sam Hill... Oh, here he is. Oh, beat me to it. I'm sorry I have to wait. How are you, Ted Boy? Fine, Barney, just fine. And you must be Johnny Dollar. That's right. Uh, how are you, Johnny? Welcome to Palm Springs. Thanks. Just wait till you see the new joint I have down here. Now, listen, Ted, I'm afraid you brought him down for nothing. Why do you say that, Barney? Well, I used the old noodle. I did some thinking about who might have embezzled 170 G's. And the more I thought, the more sure I got about who did it. Who? And I'm willing to bet that if you face up to him and tell him that I'm on to him, he'll break right down and admit it. Who, Barney? That so-called partner of mine, Ralph Betterly. Barney Garrison refused to talk further about the embezzlement until he'd taken us out and showed us through his new home. It was U-shaped and built around the swimming pool and just about as modern as an expensive resort home could possibly be. It was the kind you see written up in the movie fan magazines and only half believe is true until you see it. His penchant for entertaining on a big scale was shown by the fully equipped bars. There were three of them. One in the pantry, another in the den, and the third one, poolside. Only one thing marred the attractiveness of that pool. A huge, gaudy, garish, neon sign at one end with the words, Now is the time to... And below it was an electric clock a couple of feet in diameter with the words, Drink Popola on the dial where the numbers should have been. <laughs> you get it, Johnny? Now is the time to... And when you look at the clock, well, sure, you can tell the time, all right, but what you're really reading is now is the time to drink Popola. Yeah, I see. Yeah, sure. I want to get the togs out of here and take shots of the place for all the picture magazines. You know, publicity. So the word Popola's got to show up somewhere, and if they take a picture of me here at the pool, they can't miss it. I see what you mean. Well, just to make sure. Yeah, now, look. Here. Look at these snapshots I took this morning out here myself. Yeah, I used one of those 10-second cameras and rigged a long cable release so as I could get into the pictures, too. <laughs> see here? Yeah, yeah, I, I see. Now, uh, about this embezzlement. Yeah, and see this one? It shows me, shows the clock, shows it was 10.05 a.m., and, uh, and you see, see up there in the background, up in the sky? Oh, yeah, that's the sky we saw, Johnny. Yeah. Today is the first day for that sky riding bit. So I understand. You know, just to announce Popola. Yes, uh, I know. Uh, now, uh, Barney... But now, why don't you guys slip into some trunks and let me get some pictures of you out here by the pool? Why don't we get down to business instead? You said you think your partner, Ralph Betterly, took the money? Uh, oh, yeah. Why yeah. do you think that, Barney? Well, it's an awful thing to say, Johnny, after working together on this bottling business, but... Well, there comes a time when a guy's got to face the facts. Well, suppose you give me some of the facts. Well, to begin with, Ralph isn't a full partner with me. The deal we have only cuts him in for about a quarter of the profits. 
I see. And they've been pretty low, Johnny. Account of the startup costs on Pop Bola. Like I said, the sky writing's only started today and all the rest of the advertising and promotion. Mighty expensive, too. I'm sure it is. Anyhow, with all the money that he's had to spend on hospitals, why? It, did you know that she died a couple of days ago, Ted? No, I didn't, Bunny. Yeah, yeah, too bad. Anyway, he's been having a real tough time of it. Mm. And, um, you think that he would steal from his own company? Ah, he's been pretty desperate. But, Johnny, the real point is, and, well, I hate to say this, but he's the only one who could. Why is that? Two reasons. Don't you have a lot of employees there at your plant? Sure, Johnny, quite a few. But outside of me, Ralph is the only one who has the combination of the safe we keep all the cash in. The only one, Johnny. And if that don't put the finger on him, I don't know what does. Uh, I think you said two reasons. Oh, yeah. Number two, Ralph is the only other one who has any idea how much there was in there. Do you mind telling me why you kept that much cash on hand? Oh, so maybe it did seem like a lot, but it takes a lot to run a business, any kind of business. $170,000? Sure. But don't you see, I got to have cash to pay off the Mexican boys who... Uh, well, that is... Uh, yes, Bunny? Okay. Okay, you're not the cops or the pure food and drug fellas or anything, so you're only a private detective, so I'm going to level with you. Go on. Some of the stuff for the Popolo mix... Uh, yeah, I mean, a secret ingredient... Well, you know what I mean. Go on. Okay, so maybe it doesn't cross the border exactly legal, you know? Ted, did you know about this? I certainly didn't. Now, now, wait a minute. There's nothing poison or narcotic about it, anything like that. It's only that if those wetbacks are willing to bring it in for me, but... well, that's why I've got to keep a lot of cash on hand, okay? Is it? What's okay about running a business like that? Hey, now, wait a minute, buddy. Ted, didn't you know what kind of an outfit you were selling indemnity insurance to? I guess I didn't. Now, don't get up on any pulpit, Johnny. Garrison, have you told the police about the embezzlement? Why should I? You bet you haven't, because you know you'd have an investigation on your hands that would put you out of business so fast you wouldn't know what hit you. Oh, yeah? You think I'm not smart enough to cover up if anybody comes poking around? You don't owe me, Dollar. I don't think I care to. How do you think where I got where I am today? Answer me that. You know why? Because I'm smart, that's why. Me, I'm smart enough to get away with anything if I want to. Don't be too sure of that. Come on, Ted. Yeah? Now, you listen here, Dollar. Yes? If you think you're going out and make trouble for me... I wouldn't waste the time. Come on, Ted. Let's get on back to L.A. Yes, Johnny, and believe me, I'll cancel out every policy we have on him. Sure, go ahead. But you're still going to have to either recover the money or pay me off on this embezzlement. I'm afraid he's right, Johnny. Well, I'm not. And remember what I said. You tell Ralph Betterly I'm wise to him, and I'm betting he'll break down and confess. If he hasn't got conscience all of a sudden and blown his brains out. But you just get me that money. Item three is 50 bucks deposit on a rental car to get us back to Los Angeles, and just as quickly as possible. Because I was really worried now, and I don't mean over that $170,000. About what, then, Johnny? You have Ralph Betterly's address, Ted? Sure. Like I told you, he lives in the Westwood section on Pandora Avenue. That's out beyond Beverly Hills. Yeah, I know. Uh... But look, until we get there... Yeah? You better do a little praying, Ted. Praying? That's right. That this hunch of mine is all wrong. But all the prayers in the world wouldn't have helped. By the time we got to 1308 Pandora... Out there in Westwood, the police, including a medical and a couple of the lab crew, had done their work and left. All but a Lieutenant Harvey May. As for what had happened there? Well, you see, we got a phone call from his business partner, a man by the name of Garrison, called from Palm Springs. Oh? Yeah. Said he'd been trying to raise Betterly on the phone that he was worried about him. So one of the boys in a prowl car drove over, got no answer to the doorbell, but the front door wasn't locked. So he barged in, found Betterly dead, a bullet in his head. I come on over with the doc and the lamp crew. I see. But I figure it, Lieutenant. Looks like suicide dollar all the way. Mm -hmm. You know, because of losing his wife and financial troubles and all, and Betterly's prints are on the gun, and only Betterly's suicide. Hmm? Well, maybe. Why do you say that? Well, had Betterly pulled that gun on himself, there should have been clear powder burns on his head, see? But the doc seemed to think he might have been shot from six or uh, seven feet away. Now, he... He could be wrong, of course. Could he? I doubt it. Yeah? Why? 
When was he, um... Well, when did he die? Doc figures sometime between 9.30 and 11.30 this morning. And nobody in the neighborhood saw who might have done it? Nobody heard any shots or anything like that? No, but if you're thinking of that crooked partner of his... Why not? Uh, well, he's down there in Palm Springs. You forgetting, Lieutenant? That's not much more than a two-hour drive. But he said he's been down there since late last night. And if he can prove that... But look, I know uh, Garrison isn't Lily White. Oh, you're so right. But if he can prove he's been down there all day. Well, Lieutenant, I'm sure that he thinks he can. Well, then? And I'm almost sure that I can prove his alibi's a phony. How? Oh, how, Dollar? And if you well, can, Well, that, uh, that's out of your jurisdiction down there, isn't it? Well, sure, but all we have to do, Dollar... No, don't is... call him. Not yet. Give me time enough to drive to Palm Springs, hmm? Why? Well, you do. Maybe I'll bring you back a killer. Maybe. But if you tip him off by having the police bust in on him, you can bet your bottom dollar that Barney Garrison will think of some way to worm out of this murder. You seem pretty sure it was murder. I'm sure. And that Garrison did it, huh? I'm sure of that, too. Well? Okay, Donna, go ahead. But I better hear from you in a hurry. Don't worry, Lieutenant. You will. Thanks. <laughs> Can a girl from a small mining town find happiness with a civil service jazz musician from a big city? This problem may never be solved by Betty Furness on the CBS radio network's Dimensions of a Woman's World. But her tips on home improvement, cosmetics, teenagers, anything of interest to women could help you find a few answers that you've been looking for. Dimension of a Woman's World is heard three times every weekday with Betty Furness as hostess with the mostess. Information for and about today's woman. And you will hear the mention of a woman's world only on weekdays and only on CBS Radio. This trip I made alone. After all, why stick out Ted Orloff's neck, too, especially when I wasn't as sure of myself as I made the lieutenant think? But too many things added up. If what Ted had told me about Betterly was true, he was hardly the man to pull an embezzlement. But Garrison, if he thought he could get away with it, sure. And with a home in Bel Air and other in Palm Springs, he could certainly use the money. Then there were some other things, like his call to the police to say that he was worried about not being able to reach Betterly by phone. Really worried about him? Or just to make sure the body would be discovered? and a time of death set by a lab crew. And as the lieutenant said, to take away any suspicion from himself, time of death, that was the key of the whole thing. Garrison's alibi. And that's what got me suspicious. The fact that I'd be called on to back up his alibi. And how? Well, a little over two hours later, the door of his Palm Springs home opened. <laughs> Party. A little housewarming I'm throwing. Hello, Bonnie. I, I thought you went away mad this afternoon. I, uh... It's a noisy in here, isn't it? I decided I'd better come back. Yeah, out of boy. Uh, incidentally... Yeah. I tried to call old Ralph after you left, but I got no answer. Oh, well, why call him, Bonnie? Well, like I said to you, if his conscience ever caught up with him... Yes, I know. You tried to plant the suicide idea with me pretty solidly this afternoon. Huh? Now, why do you say plant that way? Look, where can we talk uh, quietly for a few minutes? Oh, Bernie, you're not leaving me all alone, are you? Well, just for a little while, sir. Oh. You know, just a little business. Come on, Dollar. In my den, right this way. Uh, first, wouldn't you like a drink? No, let's talk first. All right, sure. Right in here now. Well, sit down, Dollar, sit down. Well, that's better. Thanks. Now, what did you mean about trying to plant the suicide bit with you? Same as you were so careful to set your alibi with me. Alibi? What are you talking about? Now, look, I told you why I think Ralph embezzled that money, and I still think he did. Well, don't you? No. I think you did, Bonnie. <laughs> uh, now, this is no time to joke, darling. I'm not joking. All right, then, listen. Are you pretending you don't know what happened back there in Westwood this morning? You mean that Ralph... Are you pretending you don't know Ralph is dead? Oh, no. Oh, yes. 
suicide, huh? That's too bad. He was murdered, Barney. And you were the first to know because you murdered him. Yeah, now, wait a minute. Look here, Dollar. Well? Now, listen. You know that isn't true. Because you know that I was right here in Palm Springs when it happened. Then you know when it happened. Well, you said this morning, didn't you? Yeah, I guess I did. Yeah, I was right here. Now, I can prove it. Can you? Well, didn't I prove it to you this afternoon? Did you? Okay, when was he killed? Then you admit it wasn't suicide. Well, I don't admit anything because I haven't got anything to admit. I asked a question. When did he die? The medico said between 9.30 and 11 a.m. Hey, see? Well, I was right here at exactly 10.05 a.m. And you know it, and I know it, and I can prove it. So can you. How? By that picture I showed you. That's exactly what I want to see again. All right, then here. I got it right here in this desk here. Yeah. Now, look. You want to argue with this? You see the clock there in back of me? 10.05, it says. And that can be caught. Sure, and I could have taken that picture some other time, like last week, maybe. Except for just exactly one little thing, Dollar. Well, go on. Look. Look at it. I'm looking. You see, up there in the sky, in the background, you see that sky writing? Popola, that's what it says. And the whole population of Palms Bible, that that sky writing didn't start until today. Today, you get it? All right. So you killed him, then tore on out here to reset that clock, take the picture, and have your alibi all ready by the time we arrive. You're crazy. Perfect alibi, Barney, except for exactly one little thing, as you put it. I say you're crazy. Now, you look at the picture. Your swimming pool runs north and south, doesn't it? So what? You face the south into the camera. That's right. So what? So the morning sun coming from the east would have cast your shadow to the west. Over here... Ah. Instead, what little shadow there is east of you from the early afternoon sun. Because you reset the clock and took this picture just before we arrived. I see. Yes. Okay, Dollar. Now look, you see this? And it's loaded, baby. Complete with silence, isn't it? That's right. So, Dollar... <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, hiya, Sergeant. Well, looks like Lieutenant May of the West Los Angeles Department was right, huh? Now, look, I, uh, just let me explain this, huh? Why bother, Barney? Just give the sergeant the gun. So once again, it's up to the courts. But when the West Los Angeles police run down the 170000 wherever Garrison put it, and I'm sure they will, he won't have a leg to stand on. Expense account total, call it 450 bucks. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, like a lot of other people, I open the trout season, but in a way I don't suggest you try. <laughs> Believe me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone. Produced and directed by Bruno Zarato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Bob Dryden as Barney Garrison, Bernard Grant as Lieutenant Harvey May, James Stevens as Ted Orloff, Eugene Francis as the police sergeant, and Jocelyn Summers as the girl at the party. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Pat Cannell speaking. Sportsarama with Red Barber premieres April 6th, putting Major League Baseball in the Sportsarama spotlight with straight from the shoulder talk about our national pastime. April 6th, the first Sportsarama program with Red Barber on the CBS Radio Network. Do you know a new family just moving to your neighborhood? Welcome Wagon would love to welcome them. Welcome Wagon helps all new neighbors to feel welcome and wanted here in the Capital District. Each gracious welcome wagon hostess brings baskets of gifts from Tri-City Merchants. She brings greetings from the community to these newcomers, answers questions everyone wants to know about the Tri-City. You can make sure your new neighbors benefit from welcome wagon service. 
Just call State 59640 and give the Welcome Wagon hostess the name and address of your new neighbors. She'll call on them and present them with a basket of gifts from civic-minded businessmen. You'll be helping your neighbor and your Welcome Wagon hostess who carries on this valuable community service. In the Albany Troy's Schenectady metropolitan area, call State 59640. That's State 59640 for Welcome Wagon. WROW Albany, fair and cool tonight, gradually diminishing winds, the low 25 to 30. Monday, continued fair and mild, high in the low 50s. Present temperature 45 degrees.